University. Okay, so we'll um, so we're going to get started. Welcome everyone to our second CMU lecture. Um, it sounds like it went very well last uh, last month. Um, our guest lecturer today is the esteemed Dr. Audrey Duplessis. We'll be talking about posterior fossil lesions, an area that um, really is fairly complicated, but I think with the research that's being done here, we have a, um, a pretty good take on um, how to assess this and how to counsel families. Uh, for those of you who ha are called in on the WebEx, um, we will have time for questions and answers at the end of the lecture, So, um, and at that point, we will ha have you um, unmuted so you can ask your questions directly. Just to remind everyone that this is a CME activity, so to get the credit, you have to actually log in, um, sign in your name, and answer just a few generic questions to be able to get the CME credit, and that's through INOVA, but, uh, but please take advantage of it. So thank you so much, Audrey, for being our star speaker today. It's Thanks, Dorothy. So um, as Dorothy mentioned, uh, for those of us that counsel uh, pregnant families um, for possible brain malformations, there can be few areas of, of uh, our task that are more complex and frustrating than posterior fossa lesions. And I, this is primarily due to the fact that we've never really had a consistent, robust classification system um, that has stood the test of time that we could um, assess outcome against. And we've all been waiting for the genetic revolution to, um, to lay this all out for us, and there have been some really major steps in that regard, but as often happens with revolutions, things get a lot more confusing before they get clear. So um, what I'm going to touch on today is is um, a, diagno oops, a diagnostic approach to um, uh, posterior fossa lesions based to some extent on a uh, new understanding of the genetic um, mechanisms. And uh, hopefully this will provide some insight into how we go about uh, currently making these complex diagnoses. So um, for those of us that uh, see these patients sort of in the front line or the secondary line, uh, these, they usually present to us either as lesions of the posterior fossa with too little fluid, which is not the subject of today's talk, and that's usually due to a small posterior fossa. We're going to focus on those lesions where there appears to be excess fluid uh, on ultrasound uh, and or on MRI scan, um, and that could be the result of um, normal parenchymal volumes and a cyst-like structure, uh, a cystic uh, apparent accumulation of CSF, and, and that can be in the fourth ventricle, cisterna magna, or other areas. Or it can be due to uh, decreased parenchymal volume, so-called uh, an ex vacuo mechanism. And this can be due to hypoplasia and or destruction. Um, we're going to focus primarily on hypoplastic causes today. And of course, it, it, it can be a combination of these two factors, as is the case with lesions such as the Dandy Walker malformation, where you have both uh, cystic accumulation as well as parenchymal um, hypoplasia. So uh, for those of you who need a quick update on the cerebellum, this is what the developing brain is trying to achieve uh, in the posterior fossa. So, uh, the normal mature cerebellum has an anterior lobe and has a posterior lobe. And contrary to traditional um, thinking, uh, the vermis, the midline vermis, does not form through fusion of these two um, uh, sets of lobes, but it forms from its own independent primordium. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So here's a, a midline sagittal view through the the uh, posterior fossa showing the tectum, or the posterior part, dorsal part of the midbrain, the ventral part of the midbrain, midbrain the tegmentum, the pons, the medulla, and then um, these various lobes of the cerebellum. So this is where we're trying to get to when we're uh, in development. I'm going to talk about um, 
normal and abnormal development from three broad perspectives that I think there's been uh, progress in in recent years. Um, defining the midbrain hindbrain uh, territory, which is a, a fundamental step in this process, uh, mesenchymal neuroepithelial signaling and its disorders, and then uh, neuroproliferation, the various cellular compartments of uh, the cerebellum. Starting off with the midbrain hindbrain territory definition, so towards three weeks um, post conception, so five weeks post menstrual, uh, a series of constrictions appear in the anterior or rostral neural tube that result in uh, the three main uh, vesicles, the prosencephalon or future forebrain, the mesencephalon, which is the midbrain, and then the rhombencephalon, which is our area of interest today. The rhombencephalon has eight rhombomeres, so separate areas of uh, territory that undergo uh, differential development under the influence of uh, genetic um, uh, products. Patterning of the entire neuroaxis happens um, a along a number of axes. So there are dorsal to ventral um, influences, rostral to caudal, and medial to lateral uh, patterning influences all along the neural uh, tube. Um, in our situation, uh, the area that we're talking about today is we're primarily focused on the first rhombomere. I said there were eight. We're primarily focused on rhombomere one and rhombomere two. The vermis develops from rhombomere one and the rest of the cerebellum from rhombomere two. But this structure here, which is a very um, discrete cluster of cells, is called the ismic organizer, and it is critical to the uh, ongoing discussion here. The ismic organizer, the, throughout the developing nervous system, there are at various times uh, clusters of cells that exert influence in the territory around them um, uh, through genetic um, uh, gene products uh, that stimulate and organize cell populations. So the ismic organizer is the principal a such organizer in the posterior fossa, and, and it needs to find itself at the midbrain hindbrain junction for normal development to occur. It finds that position um, by uh, developing at the interface between uh, expression of two transcription factors, so OTX2, which uh, determines midbrain, um, future midbrain events, and GBX2. And as with all of these uh, processes throughout the nervous system, these substances both suppress the activity of other substances around them and promote their own uh, cause in the area. So that's how the ismic organizer um, finds its location, uh, its normal location. If there are disturbances in those influences, it may be um, misplaced. Once the ismic organizer is um, at its, uh, in its correct position, it then starts to uh, secrete various um, growth factors and uh, gene products, fibroblast, fibroblast growth factor being um, a, a very important one, and particularly FGF8. FG8A uh, stimulates the subsequent development of the midbrain tectum, and 8B is critical for the subsequent development of the uh, cerebellar primordium. And so when these, when these processes go wrong, there is either, um, and this is a general statement about CNS development, there's, uh, there are uh, changes or abnormalities in tissue gain, tissue loss, and transformation at the boundary zones of these areas of influence. So here you can see um, this is from Barkovich's book. Um, you can see a long, uh, a prolonged um, midbrain, relatively short pons, this um, markedly abnormal tectum, and vermian agenesis uh, and dysgenesis over here. This is a, a case from our own um, uh, population, and you can again see here this markedly dysplastic. Um, midbrain tectum and underdeveloped vermis. So these, and probably a thickened uh, midbrain here as well. So these are some examples of what presumably is a disturbance in the original 
correct location of the ismic organizer and its subsequent expression. Now, between the third <coughs> and fifth weeks post-conception, a number of flexures develop at the anterior rostral end of the neural tube. And the one that most concerns us today is the pontine flexure, which uh, develops around about the future body of the, um, the, the belly of the pons. But in doing so, in flexing here, um, there is a bulging out of the dorsal neural tube. So you're looking from the back, from above, if the baby's lying face down. Um, there's a, a, a kink that develops and a bulging out. And together with mesenchymal uh, influences, there's a thinning of this roof of the future fourth ventricle. So moving on now to this process of mesenchymal neuroepithelial signaling, um, this is a very uh, important part of fourth ventricular, the roof of the fourth ventricle's development, and in many of the abnormalities that, that um, we encounter uh, when we see these kids. So just going back again uh, into neuroembryology. So during neural tube uh, formation, there's um, interplay between a ventral mesoderm and the neural tube as it closes. Then the mesoderm surrounds the neural tube in a solid core of mesodermal tissue, and there's constant signaling between these developing tissues. This, this goes in this sort of clockwise direction. What happens subsequently is this mesoderm breaks down uh, and becomes trabeculated and eventually becomes the subarachnoid space. Um, and when there are loculations of tissue during this process, that's what many people believe is the origin of arachnoid cysts, that you get uh, mesodermal remnants here that secrete fluid and form a cyst. But this mesenchyme uh, develops into a vascular mesenchyme, but also into the dura and the dural sinuses. And you know, as you all know, the torcula and the dural sinuses uh, are an important landmark for us in these conditions. But even once the subarachnoid space is formed by the um, arachnoid and the peel layer, which I didn't draw in here, so both of those are mesodermal structures, there is an ongoing signaling between these tissue types. And we know from some syndromes such as the FACES syndrome, which is an acronym for posterior fossa anomalies, and various cutaneous or mesodermal uh, abnormalities, including vascular, uh, sternal, and ocular abnormalities, as well as this case, this really sad case that was referred to us by one of our colleagues in the community, um, referred to us during the fetal period where we saw these posterior fossa anomalies, this uh, CSF accumulation in the posterior fossa, this abnormal looking vermis. Uh, and of course we did not see, we were not able to detect the cutaneous lesions in utero and this was a shocking surprise once this baby was born and diagnosed with neurocutaneous melanosis. Another um, a combination of uh, mesenchymal and neuroepithelial anomalies. Besides those more dramatic cases with you know these obvious striking external features, mesenchymal neuroepithelial signaling defects are thought to play a role in um, most, if not all, of the common lesions that we uh, see in our clinical practice uh, in the posterior fossa. So. This again is a dorsal view of the future roof of the fourth ventricle. And around about the 10th week of gestation, a horizontal strip of tissue develops a, a fold or a crease develops from uh, across these lateral angles of the roof of the fourth ventricle, and that is the future choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle. But what's also important here is that it divides this thin roof of the fourth ventricle into two parts, an anterior part and a posterior part. This is the anterior membranous area. There's our ismic organizer. And this is the posterior membranous area over here. And this posterior membranous area will be where the midline um, foramen of Majandi forms and the lateral lushkas form out in the, in the corners there. So, with this in mind, 
Let's um, move on now to what happens to the roof of the fourth ventricle. This is a, a lateral view of this uh, dorsal, original dorsal presentation here. And so this is the f uh, fourth ventricle. This would be the subarachnoid space over here. This over here is uh, the choroid plexus, anterior membranous area, posterior membranous area. Now, a number of things happen in this region under mesenchymal neuroepithelial uh, signaling influences. Um, and if they don't happen correctly, um, we have trouble. So the first thing that needs to happen is as the vermis develops, it takes up the anterior membranous area. If the vermis fails to develop, remnants of the anterior membranous uh, area may persist. The second thing that happens, and I'm focused mainly on the, on the anterior membranous area here, but the second thing that happens, and this is in the posterior membranous area, is foraminal uh, openings appear. But again, the, um, the vermis, and the anterior membranous area uh, undergo sort of simultaneous uh, um, inverse developmental processes here. And if, if that fails to happen, <clears throat> if there's failure of um, vermal formation, failure of uptake of the AMA, and if there is either delay or failure of these um, uh, foramina to open, then probably under the influence of pulsations in the CSF from the uh, uh, vascular pulsations in the, in the brain, uh, this redundant anterior membranous area uh, becomes cystic, bows out, and leaves you with a combination of vermian hypoplasia, um, not, so this residual cystic area is non-uptake of the AMA, um, abnormal foraminal opening is a difficult one because a, a, a large number of Dandy Walker malformations, at least at autopsy, are shown to have at least partially open foramina. So the question is whether those are delayed or uh, insufficient openings for CSF egress. <clears throat> and so here's a, a, a condition. Here's uh, a fetus with, sorry. Here is a fetus with Dandy Walker malformation. And you can see mesodermal structures. Um, this uh, torcula is meant to reach its um, final destination at about 12 weeks of gestation, implying that uh, something arrested this on the, on the way down earlier than that. Um, you have, uh, so that's a mesodermal structure, uh, the hypoplastic vermis, uh, this large cystic CSF space here. So a combination of neuroepithelial and um, mesenchymal mesodermal structure abnormalities. So moving on now to the posterior membranous area and assuming that the anterior membranous area and the vermis have developed normally so far. So the <coughs> vermis has taken up the anterior membranous area. I've uh, enlarged this area over here, which is the area of interest. Uh, to show that there's the mesenchymal layer, which is the arachnoid, running along here. Uh, this would be the subarachnoid space, and this is uh, the ventricular space. What needs to happen is a connection across here. So you have mesenchymal stimulation of the pia, the underlying ependema, which is this blue layer over here that lines the entire ventricular system of the of the nervous system, and so. Um, the first thing that needs to happen under mesenchymal uh, stimuli is that there is an opening of the peel space that develops, followed by an outpouching of the ependema, and that is the so-called Blake's pouch, which is normal. And the next thing that happens under uh, mesenchymal stimulation is that you get a sort of decapitation of that uh, Blake's pouch and the full-blown foramen of Majandi is formed. So um, when that fails to happen, uh, you can get a bowing out of this posterior membranous area. And importantly, this choroid plexus gets dragged out onto the roof of the cyst. Um, so the Blake's pouch is a normal uh, structure. It's when it becomes enlarged and cystic that um, it has an abnormal appearance. And so what you have here, this is from Ashley Robinson's work, who's done a lot of uh, clarification of this complicated area. 
what you have here is a lateral view, ponds, vermis over here. There's um, the choroid plexus dragged out on the undersurface of the vermis and then the cystic area over here. This is from a postnatal study, a 24-week preterm infant. This is a mastoid view of the posterior fossa. So one cerebellar hemisphere, vermis, other cerebellar hemisphere, fourth ventricle, aqueduct, third ventricle. And what you have over here, these two septations, uh, he is um, suggesting are the walls of a uh, Blake's pouch cyst, and I think he's uh, almost certainly right. Uh, can, on other uh, images of this type, uh, you can see that this fluid and this fluid are similar in consistency, whereas this fluid here, which is in this trabeculated region of the subarachnoid space, tends to be slightly more echo-dense. Now, here's where there's some um, uh, inconsistency uh, in the theories for f uh, formation of the megacisterna magna. Robinson believes that what you have is um, that there is, at some point during development, a uh, Blake's pouch cyst that forms, lifts the cerebellum, uh, the vermis up, um, stays in place for long enough to um, restructure this um, cisterna magna area and then perforates, allowing the vermis to drop back down to its original position, but leaving an empty space back here. Another school of thought suggests that this megacisterna magna is actually an abnormality in the formation of the base of the skull. So a, a mesodermal uh, disturbance with an enlarged uh, cavity space at the base of the skull. And it's this area over here below the inferior part of the vermis down to the foramen magnum. And here is a uh, normal 33-week um, fetus. So there's some controversy about um, the exact formation of the megacisterna magna. But of note, it has a normal vermis, normal-sized fourth ventricle. Um, okay, now I'm quickly going to move through um, cerebellar neuroproliferation because this is another very important uh, component of um, our problems in the posterior fossa. So there are um, there are a few places in the nervous system where you get more than one neuroepithelium, but here this is one of them. So there is a primary neuroepithelium that develops, like other uh, neuroproliferative areas, along the edges of the ventricles. There's also neuroepithelial cells uh, towards the lateral parts called, of, of the developing cerebellum called the rhombic lips. And there is formation of a secondary neuroepithelium. This, by the way, is a cross-section of the neuro, neuro axis here, and we're just looking at one side. So... If we go to the primary neuroepithelium, this uh, ventricular or uh, periventricular neuroepithelium is the source of all inhibitory neurons for the future uh, cerebellum, and it forms the nuclei deep in the cerebellar tissue, but importantly, it forms a, a set of a, a layer of cells along the surface of the developing cerebellum called the Purkinje cell layer. Um, conversely, at the rhombic lips, um, there is a cluster of um, neuroepithelial cells. These all stain positive for um, the substance 801. And these um, neuroepithelial cells can migrate anteriorly and ventrally to form uh, the pontine nuclei and various other nuclei, which is another reason why those are sometimes defective when there are anomalies of the cerebellum, or these cells migrate over the surface. They sort of creep over the surface of the developing cerebellum to form the secondary neuroproliferative area, the external granular layer. Now, this, is, this layer is what contributes most to cerebellar volume. If you have failure of external granular uh, 
cell proliferation on the surface of the brain, and this process continues into the postnatal period. <laughs> Failure of that will give you severe um, uh, cerebellar hypoplasia. But this is not the only way in which uh, you can have that develop because these Purkinje cells that came from the ventricle, for the edge of the ventricle, are critical for keeping that process of neural proliferation of these cells going. So if you get um, a, a disturbance in the formation here, even if these cells do develop normally and migrate out, they are not supported and they're not maintained in a mitotic state for long enough. So you can get, in both those situations, you can get a condition such as this, a child I saw in Boston with absolutely no pons, no cerebellum, there were just these little slivers of uh, superior cerebellar peduncles here. But this uh, almost complete loss, in fact, I would call it complete loss of uh, the cerebellum and its related structures. Were there also orbital changes in that? Cell? No. no. So this is the, um, the vermis, as you know, is an area we often uh, zone in on when we're um, uh, examining these babies radiologically. The vermis starts to form, as I said, from its own primordium, and it starts to form superiorly and develops in this sort of semicircular way, clockwise way, um, to completely cover the fourth ventricle by about 18 weeks. Some people will give it up to 24 weeks. Um, but because of this, this uh, sort of trajectory of, of vermian development, um, there's been some confusion in the literature about um, underdevelopment of the vermis, and I'll touch on that now. So as, as I said before, the vermis and the hemispheres form from distinct primordia. They don't, it's not a fusion issue. Uh, and the primordia for the anterior lobe and the posterior lobe are also distinct. So this lobe here doesn't depend on this lobe first forming. What's also very important um, is that this area over here, these three lobulations, the deck leave, the folium, and the tuber, this is the neovermis, and this is a massively expanded area in humans. And this is thought to be the seat of those cognitive and affective disorders that happen in humans when there are developmental uh, abnormalities of the of vermian development. It's also what um, is now thought of as sorry. What's now thought of as the cause for this downward propulsion of the inferior lobe. So it's it's likely that these inferior lobes are are formed early on, but they're pushed down much in the way that the corpus callosum pushes backwards. Expansion of this area is what causes this kink over here and causes this growth in an apparent um, semicircular manner. <coughs> so in assessing the vermis, there are certain landmarks that we can look for. Um, firstly, the primary fissure is, is that landmark on the surface that allows us to distinguish the anterior from the posterior lobes. This vestigial point is this little triangular point over here and a line drawn between them is what allows us to separate those two lobes. And the relationship of a fully developed vermis should be roughly one-third to two-thirds. We also measure this angle over here, which is the angle between the uh, ventral most parts of the vermis and the uh, dorsal part of the tegmentum. And then we have uh, gestational age-related uh, measures uh, for vermian size. When there is vermian hypoplasia, and as I, s boy, I'm sorry about this. As I said, um, it's, uh, it has been uh, called by many, including myself, inferior vermian hypoplasia in the in the past, but it is more likely failure of development of uh, other parts of the vermis that fail to curve it down in this direction. So here you have a relationship that's less than one-third, two-third. You may or may not have a clear primary fissure, and this vestigial point is very is a very um, sort of flattened out 
the angle, uh, if there's an angle at all, and the overall vermis size is decreased. So that, those are the indicators of inferior vermi and hypoplasia. I've spoken about the Blake's pouch cyst. In a, with a Blake's pouch cyst, the vermis should be normal. The relationships of the lobe should be normal. The primary fissure should be where you expect it to be. The vermis size should be normal. And if you're lucky, you may see the choroid plexus stretched out underneath it. I find this tegmento vermian angle useful only if this structure here is, is uh, normally formed. Um, and here is a case of inferior, verm <laughs> inferior vermian hypoplasia. Oh boy. Excuse me one second. Okay. okay, nearly there. Okay, this um, uh, a case of inferior vermian hypoplasia, where you see this um, vestigial angle here is is opened up. It doesn't have that characteristic triangular uh, space. This uh, relationship between the anterior lobe and the posterior lobe is not terrible, but it's less than two-thirds, one-third. There's probably also some expansion of the fourth ventricle here, which brings me to a point that I'll get to in the next slide, and that is that we, one of the problems that we've had, I think, uh, in this area is that we've always thought of these as discrete lesions, and I think what the genetic, um, uh, sort of the rush of genetic information that we've acquired recently would point to this being um, to this being not just a, a um, Blake's pouch cyst or a Dandy Walker cyst or Vermian hypoplasia, but that variations in the development of all of those structures can come together, and uh, you do, you can't always fit them squarely into one box. So that you could have uh, inferior Vermian hypoplasia, but there's no reason why at the same time you couldn't have a distended. Blake's pouch just at the same time from a, a, a mesenchymal um, disturbance. And so here, for example, this uh, case was published in the literature as a Blake's pouch cyst. And the point they were trying to make, which is uh, interesting, is that this is the choroid plexus under here, and there's the choroid plexus under there. In this case, it was easily seen. That's not always the case. However, if you look at this, this is more than a Blake's pouch. You can look at this midbrain. It's a short, stubbly midbrain. The tectum is just a, a short little area of tectum. This anterior lobe looks expanded to me. Um, uh, so there are many things happening here in addition to a Blake's pouch. So, so I think, uh, onto my last slide, I think the essential points that have emerged uh, from research in recent years um, are number one that there are a host of uh, uh, developmental stimuli or signals that have to happen. They have to be very uh, carefully orchestrated, um, both in relative to each other as well as in time. Uh, those uh, that there are stimuli from these organizing centers, and those organizing centers have to be in the right location, or else subsequent development will fail. Um, that. Phenotypic variability results in differences both because of the timing as well as the dosing of effects. So a mesenchymal, uh, a deficient mesenchymal stimulus doesn't have to give you the same picture every time because there's dosages of, uh, of stimulation. And so I think what will happen in future, probably after my time, but what will happen in future is that the development will be in the area where we can more precisely, for all of the various parts of the uh, posterior fossa, where we can better describe the genotype-phenotype relationship, because both the genetic field continues to expand rapidly, but we're also able now with quantitative MRI to uh, better define the anatomy. And that the functional topography of the developing cerebellum is critically important. What uh, deficiencies in the posterior fossa, what their long-term results are. So if you have the neovermis underdeveloped, what do those kids look like? 
Um, and what do they look like depending on when in gestation you see these lesions? So I think those are the essential points that I'd like to make um, uh, with regard to recent developments in this area. And I'll stop. I went a little over. And that was perfect. Uh, wonderful. I guess we could unmute. Uh, is there any uh, questions from the audience out out in the Netherlands? Um, I, I, I do have a question for you, Audrey. So for um, a Blake's and Dr. Bezina is still here? Or did he yeah, it's uh, For a Blake's pouch. Oh, they're unmuted, okay. Do you um, consider that as an, a normal variant that once the foramen opens up, it should right. be normal because here you had some cases where you saw some anomalies. Right. So I think I think that's um, an important question. I think an isolated Lakes pouch cyst um, should be a normal variant. Yeah, because it doesn't really involve uh, the parenchyma everywhere is normal with an isolated Lakes pouch cyst. But the point I was trying to make towards the end is that you, there's no reason why you can't have a Blake's pouch mechanism in the setting of other signaling disturbances in, um, in the parenchyma. So in those cases, and there are descriptions in the literature of Blake's pouch cyst cases that have abnormal development. And I would expect, this obviously needs a very careful study, but I would expect that those cases have more than a Blake's pouch cyst. So this tendency to say, well, it looks more like a Blake's pouch than a Dandy Walker, uh, um, and try and put it into one category, I think is what will change in future, that it will be a description of what the actual deficits are. So the tectum is abnormal, the superior cerebellar peduncle is thickened and is a Blake's pouch cyst. It'll come down to that and a complete, complete reclassification rather than trying to say, this is Dandy Walker, this is Blake's pouch, which I think that can't happen too soon because you know that with all of the Dandy Walker variant diagnoses that are out there, what currently happens is parents go online, they look up Dandy Walker, leave out the variant part, see what Dandy Walker does and decide to terminate before they've even gotten to us. So um, I think a reclassification is long overdue. And I think, again, essential points are that uh, ultrasound, if we're going to be looking at posterior fossa, we really do need 3D, um, you know, to all three planes. And then um, MRI, I think, is really critical when we're assessing a potential posterior fossa abnormality. Um, but with these, the progress, this, I think these are the cases where if a family does indeed to decide to continue where a third trimester MRI, you know, can be very, very helpful because it does change so much. And, um, and I guess from the postnatal imaging, I think sometimes getting that information before delivery can help planning for delivery and presentation right. and neonatal. I think the last point is, is very um uh, pertinent because we now know that these various parts of the brain stimulate each other during development. And so if you do have areas of the cerebellum that are underdeveloped and are not normally active, their intended projection areas in the supertentorial part of the brain may be deficient and result in underdevelopment there. We see that in preemies with cerebellar hemorrhage, for example. So, um, I think identifying an anomaly in the second trimester in the posterior fossa doesn't mean that that's all you've got. There are critical things that still have to happen in the cerebral cortex in the third trimester that um, could very well be implicated in the ultimate outcome. For, for the counselors, I know this is a very difficult area for, for families. Is there something that you find useful with the ultrasounds and MRIs, or do you always have trepidation when you have to speak with families about the diagnosis? What do you mean? Well, if I think when we say it's a megastrita magna, that tends to be considered a normal variant. I think we still struggle a little bit with Blake's pouch. Mm -hmm. And then um, 
how do you approach the other abnormalities when we can't quite be definitive? Um, in terms of, I mean, how do we talk about the ambiguity and yeah. kind of the uncertainty overall? Um, well, I mean, I think we just do our best to explain that, you know, that the, the technology at this point can't tell us everything and we're looking through mom into baby and we can't be 100% sure. And I mean, I think the hard part is, you know, the cases where we should, determining which cases we should bring them back and which cases we shouldn't in the third trimester and whether that's going to help us or not. I think, I think in general we've leaned towards, unless there's, you know, we're really highly suspicious that something huge is going to change. I mean, I don't think we're bringing most of our Tammy Walkers back and that type of thing, so I don't know. If Are you recommending all of them to have chromosomal analysis and a cardiac echo? Like, what, what's the part? What is your strategy? Oh, in that sense, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, we, we absolutely talk about it in all of the cases. I mean, even the normal variants, we bring up the possibility that we can't be 100% sure that there's not something else going on. I don't know that we recommend it one way or the other, but we certainly talk about it and bring it up and talk about and syndromic my, association. The testing is usually normal. The testing is typically use, normal. The genetic testing at this point, prenatally for brain anomalies, isolated brain anomalies, um, often doesn't come back with any And do you have any data about cardiac versus post year fossa anomalies? I know there is you no know, association of one with the other. With post year fossa, it's just slightly higher. Would you? Get a dedicated fetal echo, or do you think um, just a routine exam of the heart may be sufficient for these cases? Yeah, I don't. I, I must say that I, unless there are other anomalies, I, I personally have not recommended uh, a dedicated fetal echo. Um, you know, there are um, conditions where you get cutaneous cerebellar and cardiac malformations. Some of the uh, faces, uh, babies have cardiac vascular anomalies as well. So there is an overlap. Um, but I can't say that I have routinely uh, recommended a dedicated echo. Usually go with uh, what we see of the heart on the, the higher level. Yeah, of. I think for us, the, you know, like the feces and the, the, the melanin, we need to work harder in looking at the skin. I, you know, we're See, if we can see irregularity the 3D surface, surface mm -hmm. of the, um, by ultrasound, but I think also MR, we do have some 3D methods that we need to push the envelope and see Actually, if we can. With that neurocutaneous melanosis kit, if you go back and look at the fetal MRIs, you can, if you, there, she had a, a, a late uh, third trimester, like a 34-week uh, MRI, you can see this, those rays. Uh, um, skin manifestation, but you had to have been like constantly thinking about thinking it. Yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But again, it, it, what makes it better in the future is you know having a case like this, having some positive findings, and then saying that we're not going overboard when we suggest it or catches our eye. But I think that's how we learn is when we see something postnatally yeah. and look back at the imaging and see that oh yes, I can see that. So that prospectively, you may be able. Makes that. that, yeah. <laughs> for those of for those of you that um, have dialed in, um, I can't unfortunately see who you are. I know there are people online. Um, are there any questions or comments that you'd like to make? I think uh, I think that's a no. Okay, well, thanks anyway for joining us. Um, we really uh, appreciate you coming in on this. Right, and then just remember everyone for CME, you know, just kind of um, you need to log in yourself and get the CME. Okay, well, thank you so much, Andre. It was a great, great presentation, very thoughtful as usual. And more work to be done. <laughs> Lots more work to be done. Uh -huh. mm -hmm.